Good evening and welcome to The Square. Tonight we bring you a frank and dynamic discussion on the state of drug and alcohol abuse amongst young people in the country and also linking it to mental health. Now before we started the show we had some people calling in and tweeting in and trying to tell us drug and, uh, drugs and alcohol are not really correlated or mental, length, mental health sorry, is not linked to the two but we're here tonight uh, to have an informative discussion with the panel and our guests on these issues especially amongst Rwandan youth in the country. My my name is Dan MPC, I'm joined, and I am part of the Square. And our guests for tonight, uh, thank you for joining us, by the way. I'll start with Dr. Yvonne Kaiteshonga, who's the Nas National Director of Mental Health at the Rwanda Biomedical Center. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, too. Or is it the Nas uh, Mental Health Division Manager? Yes. Yes, I think that's a yeah. better yeah. title. Yeah. Um, from Rwanda Biomedical Center, also Ministry of Health. We're also joined by Alice Bangana, a young lady with us tonight, and uh, she's the Learning and Development Coordinator at Agahozo Shalom Youth Village. Alice, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Uh, as always, the square is made up by our resident panelists, Afraim Romendje. Thank you for being with us this evening. Thank you for having me. And Berna Namata. Thank you for having me. Um, we are also usually joined by our fourth resident panelist, who's not here with us, Charles Habba, wherever he is. Is away on business. I'm sure he's watching to the show and will contribute a lot um, by our social media on the show tonight. Um, as we always do, we have the usual, not weekly roundup, but midweek roundup because mm. it's, it's a Wednesday. And uh, yeah, just basically highlights of the week. And I'd like to start with you, a friend. <laughs> I, know, I know what you, wanna, you want me to talk about. Yes, you know what I want you to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> now, I, 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 for me, my week, or at least one of the highlights of the week was uh, meet the president. It's, uh, it's always... Lucky you. <laughs> I was with tw 2,000... I'm jealous. Uh, <laughs> youth, but I, it, was, it was an experience, um, always to hear from, 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 from His Excellency. Um, and he touched on what we're about to talk about today. Um, and I brought up an issue of my own around... Um, our regulatory f structures, or at least policy structures, um, around how NGOs participate in the private sector um, and what that means for our economy. Because again, it seems isolated and it's, they, it seems small now, but I've seen a lot of, and I shared some of the statistics. Um, obviously, there are more factors that lead to such stuff, but I do believe there's a huge part to, played by, by having non-players of the private sector playing in the private sector and undermining its, its ability to thrive. Um, but which, yeah. which got your thoughts published in the New Times the newspaper? New Times. I, I believe <laughs> the New Times go with a story and, and it's genuinely it's a, it's it a, it's a, a story. story yeah. It is, yes. Yeah. yes. I'm, but I'm glad they did. Um, and I hope it, it actually highlights that because I'm not the only one. My sector is not the only one. There are many sectors where a lot of people are at, because there's no robust framework to, to accommodate this, uh, the, at least social enterprises in this context, you find that a lot of people have to just suffer and see their businesses closed down and don't know who they can turn to. Um, but yeah, I hope, I hope it really gets addressed, or at least it, people give it the seriousness it deserves. Um, because we're a developing economy and we need to develop more advanced and sophisticated frameworks to accommodate that growth. Yeah. Brenda, is there something you'd like to add? Or? Um. I thought it was an interesting, a very interesting session. Uh, I followed it on RBA. Um, one of the key highlight, highlights for me was uh, a young woman who was asking about uh, connections. <laughs> uh, that aside, uh, I'm still insisting on Jeff Polly. Mm. Uh, justice, violence. yes, uh, justice should be done. And three, uh, this week, as journalists, we've been seeing lots of uh, troubling uh, news uh, coming from Uganda. You know, journalists being targeted and beaten like herds of cattle, you know. The, I don't know if you've seen these videos. Uh, it's really shocking. I mean, as journalists, we are just messengers. You know? So don't shoot the messenger. Uh, focus on the message. It, it doesn't make sense to shoot the messenger because at some point you'll need them anyway. Uh, yeah, so for me, those are the few highlights for the week. So we're going to get into this conversation. It's quite meaty. We have drug and alcohol abuse. We have mental health. 
uh, and uh, we also have you know a culture of, of, of alcohol and drug abuse that we also want to explore and uh, my first question is, is, is before we get into the rise of alcohol and drug abuse in the country as evidenced by you know some studies that have been carried out I want to start on the link between mental health and drug and alcohol abuse and uh, my question is to both of you, um, Dr. Kaita Shonga and Alice. Um, you know, studies have shown that most cases of drug and alcohol abuse are actually a manifestation of, of users actually hiding more deep-seated issues and using al alcohol to mask uh, mental issues. In this case, this is usually referred to as a dual diagnosis or a co-occurring disorder. In both your experiences, what is the reality of this amongst young people? And I'll start with you, Dr. Kaita Shonga. I would say that uh, when then young people, like everywhere in the world, need to explore, they need to discover, they need also to define their identity. So they can uh, follow kind of role model among uh, drug abusers, and that's uh, how they can themselves become or abuse of drugs or alcohol, and worse, become drug or alcohol dependent. As an adolescent, this is a developmental phase between childhood and adulthood, so he's not yet uh, mature, vulnerable. He's vulnerable, and um, the fact that drugs and alcohol are uh, available, and also belonging to a group, a group in which uh, peer, some peer use uh, drug abuse, that makes him vulnerable and can uh, end up uh, taking him into uh, those behaviors. In Rwanda, there is a study in 2012 conducted by our ministry in charge of uh, the youth in collaboration with the University of Rwanda where uh, we found the prevalence a bit high, high because uh, the study showed that 52% of our young people mm. between the age of 18 and 35 have consumed at least one once one drug or more. Mm. And in their lives? Yes, in their lives. Yeah. This yeah. 52%? 52%. Mm. Yeah. This is a, 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 a big issue. Yeah. yeah. If, you, if you talk, we, we talk uh, as. And among them, 7% seven, were found to be dependent to alcohol, 5% dependent to uh, tobacco mm. and 2% dependent to cannabis. Mm. Uh, that's, uh, that's the reality. I think uh, we need to, to, to update, to have some update, and we have started. Mm. Yeah, we, we, are, we are conducting another uh, survey mm. and among uh, the, the, the mental disorders we are going to, to, to search are uh, also drug and alcohol mm. abuse. Mm. And this time it will be from 14 to 65. Mm -hmm. yeah. but, uh, but do you think sometimes that, uh, you know, these numbers, whether it's cannabis, whether it's tobacco, whether it's alcohol, the link with mental health, do you think this is something that's actually a reality? And I ask this because, um, you know, in a study published by the late Dr. Nasson in 2009, he stated that 25%, if I'm not mistaken, of the Rwandan population had post-traumatic stress disorder. Yes. And I don't know if this is passed on to children or depending on the households, but, but
the correlation between PTSD uh, as a generation after the genocide and um, alcohol and drugs, do you think this is something that is worth looking into or it's actually something that's real and happening in the country at the moment? That's a reality because among those found to be suffering from PTSD, comorbid conditions are drug abuse and other somatic conditions, but uh, drug abuse was a reality among that population. And the, the link between mental disorder and uh, drug abuse is logical. If I, I, uh, I explain more, we have categories. And from being a non-user to a drug dependent, mm. there is uh, steps. Mm. So the first, we have a category of non-user, mm -hmm. no problem. Uh, we have uh, consumers mm. for experimenters. Mm. Then we have those who uh, consume for just for fun. We have those uh, that consume uh, on a regular basis. Mm. It's, it is starting to become a, an issue. Mm. After that, you have drug dependent, mm. drug abusers, and drug dependent. So drug dependents are uh, sick people. Mm. It, it, it's a mental health uh, condition, mm. being a, a drug dependent. Mm. And vice versa, you, 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 are, you, you are not emotionally well, you will tend to take alcohol so that uh, to, 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 to feel some uh, happiness. Mm. And a, a repeated uh, drug cons consumption mm. or uh, alcohol consumption is a sickness or a mental disorder. Mm. I, I, I <clears throat> just to add to that, I read a study um, that uh, they would, they, one example, they'll talk about children with ADHD. Um, when they go through, when they are undiagnosed mm -hmm. um, from an early age and they go into their teens that are high risk, they were giving this as an example, uh, that are high risk of, uh, of succumbing to, to drug and substance abuse. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think I, I, I read that and I was, I was, I think for me, I asked myself, because what's, I've seen it around and you see how parents interact with children who could have ADHD. And you see how it's something that is, a parent just thinks a child is misbehaving or a child is not focused. And I, th my, I think my question more to, to, to you, doctor, is what systems do we have in place to diagnose um, mental illnesses and disorders early enough in the children's, in, in, when, when children are young, so that they don't become onset um, triggers for, 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 for alcohol and substance abuse? When they're older? Yeah. That's, a, that's a, a good question. And the first place to, to make such a diagnosis is within the family. So parents need to be emotionally connected to their children mm. so that they prevent, they also support because self-care is is key mm. when it comes to mental, uh, uh, mental health, peer support as well. Mm. So the first uh, person to do such a diagnose is the one living on a daily basis with uh, that child and everyone else. Mm. Yeah. But is that what we see in, yeah. in, in Rwanda? Do yeah, we see parents who actually are connected to their children or there's still that gap where parents have to be educated on how to notice the trends? I don't think they need to be educated. Mm. They need to be emotionally connected. Mm. Children or even an adult. It's, 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 it's human to, to need, to, to, they need to be understood. Mm. They need to be uh, taken care of. Because, for example, if 
I, 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 I have a headache. Mm. If I, I feel uh, like uh, I'm having symptoms of malaria, mm. I can myself take the decision to go and see a doctor. Mm. But for mental health, it's not the same. Most of the time, I even, I'm, not, I'm not even aware and I'm, may, I may be losing uh, uh, trust mm. because of my, my, my problem. So I need a, a, a sibling, mm. I need a relative, I need a friend that can say, no, this is not you. Mm. This is not you. You, 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 your mood has changed. Mm. Uh, you listen. First of all, you, you need to, to, to listen to him, mm. to give him trust, mm. to show him love, mm. so mm. that either you will be able to, to help mm. your, your sibling, your relative, your friend, without uh, having a need to, to, to take him to the doctor or a counselor, mm -hmm. or in case this is a, an indication, you will take him. But the first uh, uh, decision will not come from the person suf suffering from such a, a, a problem. Mm. That is the particularity of mental disorder. I'd like, I'd like to, to, to weigh in. Psychological problem. <coughs> Thank you. I'd like on the same, well, we, before mm. we take it a notch further with our questions to the guests, uh, to hear from Alice as well okay. on this particular topic. Because mm. Alice, uh, for those who may not know, um, other than working at Agahazo Youth Shalom as a learning and development, development coordinator, working a lot with young people, you're also on social media voice of, you know, mental health and, and self-care and well-being. And based on this link that we're talking about, if you just share a bit more with, the, with us this evening. Yeah, um, I agree with Dr. Kaiti Shonga. Um, there's a very big link between alcohol abuse and drug abuse with mental health. Um, I, I think from my experience and from all the stories that I've heard with, when I started talking about mental health um, in Rwanda, what I have come to find is that alcohol and drugs tend to be used by young people as coping mechanisms. Mm -hmm for deep-seated like emotional pain or stress or trauma or even more serious mental health disorders. But um, yeah, and I think um, from, from the stories that I've heard, they seem to be quite similar. And even from my story, um, we, don't, we don't really do a good job of equipping young people with healthy coping mechanisms. So when they do get to a point where they're faced with issues they haven't come across before, like say death of a friend or failure, mm. for example. Um, they don't know where to turn. They don't know how to deal with it in a healthy mm. way. And a lot of them, because of peer pressure and low self-esteem issues, they tend to go into alcohol abuse and drug abuse. Mm. So for me, that is what I've seen um, as sort of the root behind alcohol and drug abuse in young people. Uh, if, if, uh, and I'd want to hear from you as well in relation to what I asked. Um, are we, I know we have cultural perceptions um, that of actually, I would say, cultural blinds that, 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 that prevent us from actually seeing when somebody is suffering from, from an, a mental illness or disorder. Um, and in your own experience, do you think, and the question around parenting and family, do you think we truly understand how to see when somebody is, is, is not well? So I don't, I don't know. So no, mm. in short. <laughs> yeah. But um, also, it's not about being able to see. Mm. It is also about being able to show that mm. you are suffering. Yeah. We are very good at hiding our pain. Mm. Um, especially, I've seen this especially in young men. Mm. Um, because they're told from a very young age, you know, like, don't cry, don't show your emotions. So when they get a bit older, and we all know teenagers are a bit complicated and <laughs> there's a lot happening, um, they don't know how to talk about it in a healthy way. So a lot of them bottle it up and then, you know, it festers and it manifests itself in unhealthy habits. Mm. So I think it is, yes, uh, we don't pay attention to enough mm to notice when somebody's off, mm. but it is also that we are not, we are like very good at suffering in silence. Mm. Yeah. 
Brenna, yes? Yes. Um, I just wanted to find out uh, from, from both of them, um, listening to what Doctor was saying in terms of the emotional connection. Um, <clears throat> if you look at uh, most families, uh, they will tell you, for parents, uh, parents will tell you, I'm doing everything I can for, for my children. I'm, I'm supporting them. And they'll be very disappointed when uh, maybe their child is dismissed from school uh, for maybe alcohol or... And for them, that's the first time. But back at home, they're saying, I've done everything I, I could to support this child. Mm. So what's the missing link within the family setting that, you know, that uh, young people need to be able to cope, you know? Um, for me, I think it is, <laughs> okay, <laughs> this is a bit controversial, but um, I always say this, that a lot of parents in, in London, and it's, it's okay, it's totally fine, but um, go as far as financially providing for their families, and then, like, Using that okay, as I'm an excuse? To, oh, no, not <laughs> using it as an excuse, but <laughs> like, yeah. um, you know, like doing a lot on the financial side and not enough on the talking to your kid, getting to know your kid, mm. being emotionally connected to your kid, enough to be able to spot like very small mm. changes. Um, so I would say like time, like spend more time at home. Like time is valuable as well, as well as being able to pay for your kid to to go to a good school. I'd just like to ask, you know, um, the study that you mentioned, Dr. Kaita Shonga, uh, by the Ministry of Health, showed in this, you know, with the cannabis and the tobacco and the alcohol, um, over 50% of young people who take it once in their time. Uh, a large percentage actually came from rural areas, mm. which, uh, you know, most people will think, wait, first of all, how do they afford it? You know, this is alcohol, it's a luxury thing. But rural areas is where it, you know, it was mostly found, and uh, you know, there's a perception in rural areas it's easier to and the harsh stuff, not mm. not like they're drinking, you know, EXO <laughs> or whatever you call it, but you know, the harsher stuff, and you know, the perception is that you know there's less to do. There's first of all just electricity not being that that much, so you know, you just mm. out of boredom or even poverty. You know, there's a correlation. It's controversial between um, poverty and alcohol yeah. abuse. But the fact that it's in the village, and I want to tie it into these issues where you're talking about parents not being there for the families, is this the same? Would you say it's the same thing as well in rural areas? Because we're talking about this young people across mm. the country. So mm. urban and rural, is it, are these some of the same issues, would you say, are, are a reason for this drug and alcohol abuse? I think the, 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 the difference was not uh, at so significant mm. uh, between those two areas. Risk factors were being, the, um, if you compare those uh, in school and those out, who out of school, school yeah, exactly. yeah, that's the, the first, uh, being uh, having the two parents or being an orphan, or an orphan that was significant. But also, what else? Having parents uh, already using on a regular basis, consuming alcohol or any uh, kind of drug. Mm. No, I, I, I think for me, <clears throat> the question is, and we know this, mm -hmm. Um, recently, and uh, it's okay, I'll, I'll, we are very, quote-unquote, a controversial show. Great. Uh, we very push very unpopular opinions. <laughs> but uh, this summer, um, from Monday to Sunday, you could not tell from the number of people who were at the night, the night spots and the bars, you could not tell um, whether it was a weekend or a weekday. That's what they call a summer, so to speak. Exactly. And these children from outside countries uh -huh. back into Come back and, <laughs> and I mean, it's a, obviously, it's a over. lucrative term for the, for the establishment owners. Of course. Uh, but you ask yourself, and you talked about it, that it's very easy to dismiss it and say it's peers having a good time. Um, but when you look at some of the, excessive, the excessiveness of what these kids do when they come back, and these are, again, these are teenagers. They come back, they spend a lot of money, 
and they go over and above. Some of them, day in, day out, are consuming more than enough alcohol. Um, and they experiment with, and I know she wants to come in, but they experiment with, with, with the drugs as well. Um, and you can just, I think for me the question is always, are we actually seeing this for what it is, or we are just like, oh, it's kids having fun? And I, I think for me that's the question I keep asking. I'm like, are we as, as, as Rwandans, as a Rwandan society, um, alert enough or tuned in enough to, to call out, call a spade a spade, that children going to the club and to bars Monday to Sunday, uh, like their life is going to end that day, is, is an actual problem. And, and, and I like, and just, just very quickly, I like that you bring this up because it's part of a conversation towards the end yeah. mm -hmm. in terms of normalizing a culture mm -hmm. of, of yeah. alcohol and drugs. Um, go ahead, Brian. Yeah, just to react to what he's saying, I think it has a link to do with uh, regulation. Uh, most of these uh, children um, or young people coming from abroad are in environments that are actually where, for instance, alcohol is very regulated. You know, you cannot sell alcohol to someone below 18 or 16. If you come here, if you go to any Sumba, Simba supermarket, you actually buy as much alcohol as, as you can. It doesn't matter. As long as no you probably look 20, even if you're 16, you'll get away with so much. So I think for most of these uh, young people when they come from abroad, where there are lots of restrictions, and they come to an environment where there's almost none, then it gives room for people to actually have a field day. Mm -hmm. That's one. Mm -hmm. Two, let's look at the cost. Mm. But I would, I, would, I would want to disagree with you that the reason why the, the young people are excessively consuming alcohol and abusing substances is linked to freedom and lack of freedom. I think that there's an underlying issue that is not being addressed. And she talked about it. And it's okay to be controversial in that aspect to say, these kids probably are not getting the kind of love and affection they find at home. And that is causing to some sort of disorder or mental illness and they turn to alcohol and these excessive behaviors to cope. And I'm saying that because it's something that should be looked at in that context. Like, have we part, exploded? It's, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a combination of many factors, yeah? And I think, uh, and I insist that regulation is one of them. If you look at access to alcohol in this country, it's so easy for anyone. And I think that has to change. Uh, and it has to include the different players. I mean, Blarira has to do more, school has to do more. They cannot just be in the business of promoting alcohol. They have to do more to sensitize and also in terms of restrictions. So for me, I can understand, yes, the family setting has a bigger role to play. And uh, of course, uh, when you look at, uh, for most parents, they will tell you they feel that schools have to do more, governments have to, uh, the government has to do more mm. to ensure a safe environment for, for their children. But of course, everyone knows charity begins at home. Mm. You know, what is happening within the home setting to actually bring up uh, responsible and uh, well-grounded uh, human beings? Yeah. I think it's interesting that, you know, all five of us, mostly the four of you, uh, have brought up in this whole, you know, mental health, drug and alcohol abuse, uh, looking at the fact that, you know, the home is a core aspect yeah. of, of how all this begins and how all this can actually be prevented, um, especially when your points a frame on young people, mm. um, you know, and it's very interesting. I don't know, you know, the people watching and family is a key aspect, whether it's in rural areas, whether it's in urban areas of alcohol and drug abuse amongst young people. I mean, that's where most of the issues yeah. actually begin. Um, at least before I go to uh, uh, the doctor, are there some, in your young, in your few years on this earth, <laughs> <laughs> are there some, you know, and working with young people as a learning and development coordinator, are there some some key, like two or three key points on this particular matter that you'd like to flesh out for, for, for our audience? All right, so for me, um, for me, it's very hard to separate the two issues. So, because I think once you address um, like mental health issues, you're sort of indirectly ad addressing alcohol and drug abuse in a way. Yeah. Um, so in my experience, so I work for Agahos of Shalom Youth Village and Part of, part of what I do when I'm speaking to people is try to eliminate the stigma around talking about mental health, around um, admitting that you need help, 
things like that, seeking help, um, acknowledging you have some type of emotional pain or trauma or w whatever. Um, and I think that's the first step we should take if we're going to get to a point where um, we have a society that is more mentally healthy. Mm. Um, and I work for an organization that is so good at doing that. And they, um, we have about four psychosocial workers who work with us, and there's like one per grade, and every student in every grade has to meet with a psychosocial worker at least once a year, every year, mm. which I think is really cool because um, you already normalized the idea of like talking to somebody about your, like mm. what's going on in your head and what's going on with your feelings. And this like enables people to be able to catch little things like, um, are you, you know, drinking too much? Um, are you failing school? Are you like little things that are sort of like um, indicators of like something's going on here mm. um, without it having to have gotten to like the point of you're about to jump off a cliff or you're running mad mm. in the streets or whatever. Um, so that's one thing I've learned from my, um, from my work. And another thing that I've learned from young people is that we, we really, we really do need to do a good, a better job of listening to young people, especially if we're doing programming for young people. Um, so if we're talking about drug and alcohol abuse amongst young people, we can't just sit around and have this conversation. We have to like go out and like talk to people who are being affected by these things. Like young mm. people will tell you things about peer pressure, about um, like going out and drinking water and then being judged for it and then mm. having to pick up a beer. Mm. And um, you'll hear like, like I was talking to my sister about this and she's going to kill me. <laughs> 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 but uh, she was telling me, and I was just sort of picking her brain, she's 18 years old. And she's the kind of person who like, like she goes out and then she'll have like a water or a Red Bull. And I'm like, how does that work? You know, like. Because I know a lot of young people have a hard time sticking to their guns with alcohol and drugs and mm. like resisting peer pressure. And she's like, if you don't like, if you don't know yourself well enough, if you're not at that point, if you're mm. not confident in who you are, you're very easily yeah. swayed. Yeah. So I think that's an issue of self-esteem. Yeah. And that's huge. It's very huge. And during your teenage years is when you're building yeah. this part of who you are. And yeah, so I think. We need to invest more in just like proactive mental health care, if that makes any sense. Mm. It does. So like preventative mental health care. Mm. So teaching kids, um, if you're stressed, do this. Mm. Like giving kids the tools to cope with, um, with stress and all these other things that life throws at you, mm. um, but in a healthy way. Uh, Brenda, just very quickly before we go for the break. Um, just to underscore the need to create spaces where people, young people can actually express themselves. Uh, because right now we have stigma around rehabilitation centers. Mm. So imagine if uh, every school was to have uh, a place where you know, a young person can meet a counselor and, and, and express themselves and just speak to this person. You know. Uh, so I, I feel there's a gap there because we continue to have these specific places mm. where people have to go. And in most cases, by the time they get there, it's actually beyond redemption. Mm. How about if we create spaces, you know, in the ordinary environment where young people can actually go and talk about their frustrations and mm. they not fear to be judged? Mm -hmm. In the Very meantime, yes. I would yes. like to precise something. Mm. We, 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 are, we work as a team mm. to, in the prevention uh, strategies to fight against or to address those issues. I work for the health sector, mm. but I'm part of a, a committee mm. with gathering uh, the Ministry of Education, technicians from the organs in charge of security, the Ministry of Youth, all those social ministries and other institutions, we are together. Mm. And among the strategies, we, we train uh, people in charge of uh, 
taking care on a daily basis mm. of uh, the children while at school. So even though we don't have those counselors and you, 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 you said that mental disease go with uh, stigma, mm. they may not need or be uh, proud of being taken to Iwawa or the mm. Yab Center in Huye. So those people sensitized mm. a teacher, an animator, as we call them, mm. they, they, they are sensitized so that they can offer a good listening and uh, discuss positive uh, coping mechanisms or strategies with those young people. So in the second part of our show, yes. we will uh, discuss more of that, but there Thank is you. some strategies put in place. Thank you. The issue. So we're back on Square. No, uh, apologies for that. We're going to go to our next question. And our next question is um, Dr. Kaiteshonga, what we discussed earlier on about policy and what government is doing about it. And I'll just like to read a few stats, uh, statistics. Uh, it says that the number of youth between the age of 15 to 35, which you said earlier before, um, who abuse drugs or alcohol has been on the rise in the country. Uh, so these are figures from Deras Neuropsychiatric Hospital that show that in 2009, only 440 patients with alcohol and drug illnesses made consultation compared to 2,804 who made consultation in 2016. So this is a significant number. And uh, I want to ask, what if you, you already told us some key reasons for this trajectory, but if you can share with us what government is doing to curb this. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, we can say yes. Even reports from our health information system shows increasing of the rate of drug and alcohol consultations in our health facilities. Mm. This can be on uh, the rise, but it can also be explained by access to mental health care. Mm. And this effort we are putting in fighting against stigma going with such uh, issues. But also a uh, statistic from Rwanda National uh, Police are showing the same. To address those uh, issues, we have mass campaigns mm. where we we talk about, we sensitize against the bad effects mm. of drug and alcohol on all aspects of life. Mm. Drug abuse impairs the health on an, uh, of an individual, mm. family, mm economic development of a country because in a sense we, 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 we can't ignore that innocence is among uh, the, 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 the factors that can keep uh, that uh, problem unsolved mm -hmm. so we good we give right information mm -hmm. we we create Co collaboration among uh, different institutions in charge of uh, that uh, scourge. Mm. And those are strategies, most of them, for, for prevention. Mm. Because the, 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 the advice can be no test. Mm. No test because Consu consumption mm. uh, leads to abuse, mm. leads to tolerance and dependence. Mm. Dependence, as I was uh, saying, when we are, you are dependent to alcohol or to drug, you are a, a sick person mm. and to, 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 to be helped, mm. it will take uh, too much energy, too much resources. Mm. 
But for those addicted, the, the government has created services from the community level to the uh, federal level. We have uh, human resources. We also have a product mm. so that we can buy in case of uh, in, in case of need. We also uh, give services like emergency mm. uh, for those uh, suffering from, from overdose effect, and a big part is uh, counseling. Mm. Counseling, it, it, it takes time, but it works. If you don't for it me. to work, mm. the, 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 it's key that the person suffering from uh, that problem mm. makes his own decision. Mm. So he's, he participates, he fully participates because relapse is part of the, 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 the healing process. Mm. But the decision is the first step and the key one if mm. you want to be helped. Uh, to, 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 uh, we, we have also, uh, sorry, for those people taking heavy drugs like heroin, mm. they suffer too much from withdrawal symptoms. Yeah. So we have also a product to, 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 to help. The good news is that we have decentralized uh, care, mental health care, uh, to, 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 to treat those uh, problems. Mm. So those go with stigma, mm. the, the mass education, mm address those stigma issues so that people can go and seek care. Uh, and so I think that for me the question was, because you had mentioned that these services are on offer. Um, but at what point, or at least I would want to understand, how does an addict at, at find themselves uh, in the service of these things? How do they find these services? Is it somebody around them that takes them? Do you guys have systems to identify them? Does the addict themselves go and look for these services? If, and, and if before, before the doctor answers, I know, again, according to information given to us, that uh, there are three main centers, at least from governments, mm -hmm. uh, including Iwawa mm -hmm. and uh, two others. And uh, mm -hmm. there was a report that came out that uh, we are spending around 100 million uh, francs in terms of rehabilitation of these young mm -hmm. populations that are taken there. So mm -hmm. you can see how re rehabilitation is actually costing. You know, the ordinary taxpayer, which brings us to your point um, and Alice's point of having methods to curb this early, to nip this in the bud, mm -hmm. uh, so to speak. But please go ahead and answer Ephraim's question. If so, you, yeah, so, so the, the idea of how do addicts find, the, how do they access these services? Is it something where you guys actively go look for them? Is it a society's role to participate? Or is it the addict's responsibility themselves to go look for these services? So for where are our clients? Eh? Mm. I can today take the decision to go and seek care mm. because I'm aware that this is becoming a, a problem. Mm. Yeah, for me. We have psychologists in our health facilities. We have general nurses trained in order to be able of uh, giving such uh, care. So, so, so the expectation so, is the the expectation is that the addict will or the person suffering with the with abuse of or substance abuse can initiate and go. Yes, it can, it can go to, to, to seek care in a district hospital or in a health center where he will uh, be seen by people trained. But is that, is that always uh, the... Is that me, always mental the, health care is integ fully integrated in our general uh, care in Rwanda. And those people found in health uh, centers or district hospitals oh. are able to, to, to refer okay. to... Uh, the upper level in case of need, mm. those are specialized services found in their uh, shoes and in their hospital. But most of the time, it's possible to be uh, treated at health center level or district hospital. Uh, Brian, I know you have a burning question. I'd just like us to go to a Twitter uh, social media feed, uh, but please feel free to give it in your closing remarks. This is a, a tweet uh, from Christian Sang Rusangwa who says, Social and emotional burden of mental health as well as drug abuse is reaching bone-chilling levels. This grows slowly and silently 
We notice it when it is too late. Depression is fourth cause of disability globally, and we don't talk about it. Brenna, if you can, yes, is, does your answer tie um, into to this? No, my, my question is, is related to that. You know, yes. at, at what point can people actually begin to get worried uh, mm. about people around them? Uh, mm. Doctor, if you could directly respond to that. How much alcohol, for instance, is, is too, too much? much yeah. You know. Without using that study, I know there are yeah. studies that yeah. show How much the level of is too much. <laughs> when it, 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 it becomes a problem for the, the person consuming it, when it becomes a problem in your relationship with your loved ones, mm. when you start spending too much time in uh, consuming those drugs or alcohol instead of uh, doing your, 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 going to school or going to the, the work. And when consuming alcohol is causing you legal problems, social mm. problems, but you are unable to decide by you, yourself to stop it, this is a, a problem. What's the link between alcohol and depression? Or what comes before? You can't do your way into this. <laughs> That's the, sort of like the chicken and egg thing because. Um, alcohol leads to depression, well, depression leads to alcohol. Exactly. It's like a cycle. Mm. Um, if you're depressed, so if you're sad, for example, yeah. and you go drink alcohol, and the alcohol happy. will make you happy for a little bit, but yeah. alcohol itself could lead to depression. Like, overconsumption of alcohol could develop into depression so mm. so what would the and when alcohol is like? finished in, in in your blood you become even more depressed yeah. than uh, before think, taking it i think um treating the depression would for me in, in my head it would we would also inadvertently treat the alcohol mm. uh, abuse because a lot of people who suffer from depression have this thing where they can't quite see the future or see that they're doing damage to themselves um, or they don't care. Um, and I think treating that root cause, treating the depression, giving somebody hope, giving somebody, I don't know, like a vision of the future, being like getting them out of that hole that they're in um, could get them to a place where they're like, okay, this is a problem that I need to deal with. And then they can tackle the alcohol. Uh, our next tweet is from Braun uh, Isaleka. And Braun <laughs> says, <laughs> Alcohol access definitely needs to be regulated. And this kind of takes me to the question, Erin, I know you're a big proponent of agro alcohol regulation, but do you want to start regulating a general population you know, that consumes alcohol? And I wanted us to quickly discuss the, the uh, you know, normalizing of, of culture, uh, culturally speaking of alcohol and drugs. But, uh, I'll, 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 is, I'll, or is it just <laughs> focusing on this age segment yes. and for regulating me, that to bars, you know, yes. card people, show them, ask them for your ID, um, supermarkets as well. Ephraim, I absolutely, want to... Absolutely. I, I know Ephraim, uh, <laughs> Brenda, you agree on that. Ephraim, why, why, why are you disagree? Absolutely. For me, it's, uh, it's not about um, regulating it and making it impossible to access. No, it's just making sure that the right person gets the alcohol. Yeah, if we have uh, young people easily accessing alcohol, then there's a problem. But if you talk to bar uh, owners. owners or restaurants or supermarkets and say, if you sell alcohol to someone who is uh, maybe below 16 or 18, you lose your license. Then people will begin to. Pay I think attention. that's what's being done, but maybe yeah, they're but lenient. Then, then, Afraid, what do you, what, what's your no, take on this? That should always exist. Yeah. I'm going yeah. to be <laughs> need yeah. law enforcement. Oh, you believe yes, this is like it, this will lead to prohibition of sorts. You know, you know what happened that. in the I'm in like, the 20s in the US. There's nothing new under the sun. You go limit alcohol. I I spent some time in a country where they in, they started to limit alcohol and they increased the. They actually had an alcohol levy that went towards rehabilitation of people who were. This was in Botswana, and. Frankly speaking, it does not work. The reason why is that people will always find a way to access something alcoholic or mind-altering. Look at what, what we call the local brew and ask yourself why is it such a, a it's more prevalent than the, the primus and the... Because it's cheap. 
exactly my point. And the fact of the matter is you can try and go regulate stuff that's within the formal environment, but there's so much more that can be done in a non-informal environment. So you'd rather have a situation where you know what's going. And you can control and it. And you can control it. So what I'm saying about access is that access should not be the main agenda. It should not be the, the, the solution. It should be one of the things that needs to be tackled, but it should not be our main strategy. Our main strategy, like she mentioned, is addressing the mental health issues that are driving us to, to, to abuse alcohol and drugs. I agree. Um, what, prevention. Yeah. yeah. Yes, Elise. What, what you said about um, people will, will, will find a way to access something to alter their minds if that's what they're after. Yeah. I think definitely our best bet here is to try to sort of remove the need mm. to alter your mind. Exactly. Mm -hmm. yeah. exactly. Well, uh, we've, we're coming towards the end of the show, and I, I don't want to cut everyone short. <laughs> uh, I want everyone to give their closing remarks. You have a couple of minutes left. But technically speaking, I think this is a conversation that has to be here uh, on the square a couple of more times. Uh, it's very broad, it's very vast, it's very meaty, and we're talking about you know, alcohol abuse, drug abuse, and linking it to mental health. But uh, before we get to the end of the sh our show, I'd just like to hear from you with your closing remarks. I'll start with you, Dr. Kaita Shonga, and then quickly uh, the rest of the panelists and guests. I think everyone needs to be aware of the, the, the effect of al using or abusing of alcohol and drug. So we stop being innocent. There is no benefit in consuming drugs. And uh, you talked about um, normalizing alcohol and drug. Rwandans are not drug abusers. Even this concept, it's, it's new in Rwanda culture. Alcohol. alcohol. All the time taken uh, the first place in uh, ceremonies. Weddings. Yeah, weddings. But now, we, the government has adopted laws preventing uh, the children from uh, alcohol. So we need to enforce the, the law. But we need also to, to protect ourselves and our children and our families because even young uh, adults, uh, consume in a way that destroy their, their, mm. their life, their well-being, their mm. social life, their, their, their professional life. Mm. So being aware of that, I think it, it, it we, will, we will keep uh, educating about uh, the, the, the bad effects of uh, those things. At least very life. quickly, very, very quickly. Okay. Um, I think, I guess my thing is that um, we really need to continue working towards eliminating the stigma around seeking care and seeking emotional support and seeking social support and um, make it okay to talk about our shortcomings or like our failures or whatever is um, burdening us without it being a weakness in a way. Um, so yeah, and also um, making mental health care more accessible to young people. Mm -hmm. So making uh, mental health care very youth friendly. So um, she mentioned that it's very hard for young people to go to say Indera or um, Osehashi, uh, Kabe, or whatever. Um, but if we have a guarantee of confidentiality, if we have people who understand young people, and if we have, I don't know, like cheap, accessible psychotherapists, I think young people would be more um, more likely to access. Um, Thank you very yeah. much. Uh, unfortunately, for the resident panelists, uh, <laughs> mm -hmm. Ephraim and Brenda, we are running out of time. This is a conversation that you know has taken has taken uh, at length uh, quite a, a lot of our time this evening. Uh, but thank you very much for your closing remarks. Thank you. And uh, we've been here discussing alcohol and drug abuse, we're linking it to mental health, and uh, some of the key things that stood out was actually programming better for young people and trying to catch this and nip this uh, drug abuse and substance abuse early on uh, as opposed to dealing with it much, much later. Um, I think the next time we'll be here is learning more also about on a policy level, uh, we just didn't have time, on more issues uh, in, in terms of how government is dealing with this, with this particular issue amongst young people. Thank you for joining us. Uh, thank you to the panelists, Ephraim and Berna, Dr. Kaiteshonga and Alice. It's been a pleasure having you and having a very interesting discussion this thank evening. You, thank you. Too. Uh, to our viewers, thank you very much for listening and uh, weighing in on our social media. Catch us again here on Wednesday nights. Thank you for joining us.